Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Hi, and welcome back to the next episode of Decoding AQ, where we delve into the minds of the most groundbreaking thinkers of our time. Today, I'm incredibly excited to introduce a guest whose contributions to neuroscience have shaped our understanding of the brain like no other. He's identified and named more brain areas than anyone in history. Hold on to your seats as we welcome the phenomenal George Paxinos. He's a professor of medical sciences, neuroscience research Australia, and the University of New South Wales. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Ross, for saying good things you know, bad, or the bad things about me. <laughs> My pleasure. And in fact, uh, I just want to give every, all of our listeners a little bit more background to George. And in fact, his uh, journey in the world of neuroscience began with his BA at the prestigious University of California at Berkeley, followed by an insightful PhD journey at McGill University in Montreal. And his quest for knowledge didn't actually stop there. He further honed his skills with a postdoctoral year at Yale University. But this is where it gets quite remarkable. Uh, George, alongside Charles Watson, authored The Rat Brain in Stereotaxic Coordinates. That's a mouthful. And it's had a staggering 73,000 citations across its seven editions. And in fact, this masterpiece stands as the most cited work in neuroscience. And for three decades, it ranked as the third most cited book in all of science. So a testament to this monumental impact of George. And I want to share a few more things before we get into our questions, George, because your brilliance just emits as an author of an astonishing 59 books delving into the intricacies of the human brain and that of experimental animals. And in fact, in 2021, he ventured into a new realm with his first novel. And we're going to dive into that a little bit more as well. And that's A River Divided. And it's a captivating eco-fiction. We'll learn more about what eco-fiction as a genre is, exploring the classic nurture versus nature debate. And his extraordinary work has won him numerous accolades, including an AO, the Ramacotti Medal, the Humboldt Prize, and a $4 million NH. MRC Australia Fellowship in 2009. What's more, he's a fellow of four learned acad academies in Australia and holds the unique honour of being the only Australian as a corresponding member of the Academy of Athens. And in fact, he joins us today from Greece. So get ready for this enlightening mm -hmm. conversation as we explore the remarkable mind and journey of George. My first question to you, George, is is our human brain smart enough to solve the problems that it's created? Uh, well, that's a fundamental question. Is the brain in the Goldilocks zone? Uh, the Earth is in the Goldilocks zone around the sun. Any closer and it might burn any further, and it would all be frozen. Uh, is the brain in the Goldilocks zone? Uh, the uh, th thought I, the syllogism I we came up with is that if uh, it were smaller, it would not have been able to produce the technology which today threatens existence. If it were larger, it might have been able to understand the problem, even solved it, and that uh, the brain is just not the right size. Of course, the uh, corollary to that is, well, when is it in the Goldilocks zone? What would have been uh, an acceptable uh, brain that would uh, not uh, undermine it, our existence on the planet? I would think uh, somewhat, somewhat larger than the chimpanzee brain, which is 600 grams, and the chimpanzee is 60 kilos, we are 70 kilos on the average. Uh, so somewhat larger than the chimpanzee brain, the chimpanzee is 60 kilos, so its brain is 600 grams, and ours is 1.3 kilos. So larger than the chimpanzee brain, but not as large as our brain currently, not large enough to uh, produce nuclear weapons in the internal combustion engine, airplanes, uh, the uh, volatile compounds, so many chemicals. That is, 
if it were a bit larger than the chimpanzee to give us an existence uh, that would take us out of the troglodyte uh, domain, but not as large as now that we have a large front against nature on many things. Do you think there's a, a, a an opportunity where you talk about the size, the size of brain? In fact, I was just saying when we were off air, I'd been watching the JFK files, um, some documentaries, and they talked about uh, JFK's brain and it was weighed during the autopsy. And there was a lot of uh, controversy over it because, of course, he was shot through the head and lost a lot of his brain. Yet the uh, announcement came out that it was 1.5 kilos, you know, a, a, a very large weight for a, uh, the average human, which is 1.3. Um, but just coming to this size, the size of a brain, how important is that to our cognitive abilities around problem solving? And in, inherently, is that what limits us to really maybe some of this next evolution that might come when perhaps we have a brain computer face uh, chips when we're connected to a, a larger uh, set of intelligence or data? So. T tell me about your thoughts around this link between size, cognitive ability, and then what might be next in terms of if it's not a size evolution, but it might be a connected evolution of the brain. Right. The uh, size and uh, intelligence uh, correlation is very small. There is some, um, but not large. Um, Sandra Whittleston uh, did that study, one of the studies. Uh, so there is some, but I didn't choose my partner on the basis of the size of the hat she's wearing. So it's negligible. And you find uh, good um, authors with uh, one kilo brains and uh, good authors with one and a half kilo brains. So it doesn't seem to have a large uh, it doesn't account for much of the variance, as they say, uh, in the domain. So the correlation is low, and we shouldn't worry about that. But across species, it seems to be the reason that uh, uh, you're talking to another human and not to a chimpanzee. Uh, and the chimpanzee, of course, doesn't have the vocal cords uh, to help him, but uh, he could type to you, but he doesn't. He can have 3,000 words in... Uh, their vocabulary, the chimpanzees, uh, about the same as a little child, maybe three year old, uh, but uh, it would not be able to uh, do a lot with it. So the size there uh, seems to matter. That is, if you have the case of double the size of the brain, then uh, you uh, uh, actually make a difference there. And that's probably the reason that uh, they are not at universities, the chimpanzees. Uh, now, uh, the uh, size, of course, you might say, why, why aren't the elephants then with us who have four kilos brain or the whales that have 10 kilo brains? There, you have to consider the size of uh, the uh, animal. Uh, anyone who is larger than me will have a larger palm, a larger stomach, a larger brain. Uh, doesn't mean that they are cleverer. That is, if you have a larger body, you need to allocate a larger amount of brain to look after the housekeeping functions of the body, motor control, somatosensory sensory control, cardiovascular control, etc. Uh, so yes, there is a relation, uh, uh, and it is uh, a small one be in humans, but between. Uh, species, it seems to be uh, the reason. And of course, it's not a wonder that primates come very smart in um, tasks when they're tested. Uh, the dolphin too has a large brain and uh, uh, it, it also is uh, uh, clever. So if there's maybe, as you've proposed, these fundamental shifts that it's the relationship between the size of the body and the brain, and when there's a leap that gives a new realm of opportunity of uh, uh, cognitive ability. Now, if we take, all right, we humanity at its current uh, level of evolution and the challenges that we're now facing, what's the step change we need to help solve some of these? Are, are they around a shift of our actual 
science you know is science going to help us with these chips is it a cultural shift is it a religious shift what's the kind of reset or the the switch that we need to flick in order to make the step change necessary for the kind of future that i certainly dream of or hope for which is inclusive of the entire planet of all species that isn't just destroying either at will or without understanding or knowledge such beautiful things what's your thought about that george that's right we, we cannot expect evolution to come and change the brain i mean the brain is changing but it hasn't changed much in the last hundred thousand years i don't think so uh, and the reason that i'm saying that is uh, when you have isolated populations like the aborigines in australia uh, separated maybe a hundred thousand years from the rest uh, and uh, and the asian populations they are equally smart when they get to university, when they get the opportunity. Uh, so presumably it hasn't changed much uh, in that time. So we set that aside. Well, this that question really was why what made me write the novel, uh, River Divided, uh, was that what I think we need is a reorientation of uh, religion, of uh, science, and of culture. That is, the issue of the environment is so so large, so intractable, that it will not respond to little uh, adjustments. Uh, just if you uh, uh, permit me to mention a conversation I had with my eight-year-old granddaughter, I asked her, tell me something you will do today that does not pollute the planet. Running? I said, that's good, but if you run, you will wear out more shoes and consequently uh, then running barefoot i said that's good but if you run you build up your appetite and they'll have to slaughter more chicken to feed you then sitting in a chair i said that's very good but uh, to make the chair you have to cut a tree then lying on the ground naked Yeah, uh, the child so, mind, isn't it wonderful? Uh, yeah, that, exactly. So the task is huge, and yeah. uh, the uh, the issue is that we are uh, living under a delusion, or rather, a triple delusion. I'd say, humans uh, they they think that there's human exceptionalism. They think they have a soul. They don't give the soul to many other animals, but to, to themselves they give. They have a soul, they have free will. And uh, a third illusion, which is also a hubris, they think they are made in the image of God. If anything else, in the case of their brain, I can say this, we are made in the image of the chimpanzee. I had the opportunity to study a brain of a chimpanzee in parallel, the brain stem actually, but the brain... Uh, the entire brain of the monkey also I studied in parallel with the human. And there are actually no structural differences. The areas that you find in the human brainstem are also in the chimpanzee brainstem and vice versa. So it's smaller, but the prototype is that, that is the same. There are no differences. We have differences with the rat, with the bird, with, the, uh, with species that also compare the human brain but not with uh, the chimpanzee. So uh, this uh, hubris was, uh, uh, if it was said at the ancient times, the ancient gods would have been really incensed. Uh, they did, you remember what they did to Sisyphus? Uh, again, a story that I told my eight-year-old granddaughter, uh, I said to her, there was this king of Corinth who uh, was, uh, punished by the gods to push a rock up the hill only for it to fall down and then he had to push it up the hill the next day because he was narcissistic, egotistical and insulting. She said, like Trump. Maybe we should give him a big boulder. <laughs> that would be more, uh, certainly less destructive than some of the things he's doing. Could be, uh, could be. Yeah, I, yeah. I think one of these challenges between how we use stories 
to help our understanding and to help shift people's collective alignment. Is this somebody I want to spend time with or not? And I communicate with them and I start to then behave and do actions that are aligned to their values or not. And religion has been one of amassing a group and collection of people around a common practice or common behaviors or common values. And I think the the opportunities when I know that you've traveled a lot, you know, Jerusalem, the Vatican, Brazilian Amazon, Buenos Aires, and all of these exposures shape our thought, shape our thinking about how do I want to show up? What do I want to write about? What is the important work I need to leave as my legacy for my you know, granddaughter uh, of these things? So how have perhaps some of those travels, some of those different perspectives shaped your current writing and current thinking, George, and and share some of what that actually is when we talk about this reset in theory. What does it mean of practical steps? What could I do tomorrow in order to help me and humanity? Yeah, well, that's right. I faced that uh, dilemma for a long time and uh, since uh, 1969 when uh, in Montreal I was handing out leaflets against cars and in favor of bicycles. I even uh, was a candidate of the Australian Cyclist Party uh, in uh, elections in my state, uh, and uh, the uh, I was trying to get a handle of this. I thought that science would be enough to uh, pass the message, and uh, the information would be sufficient. But I think people tend to work on emotion rather than on fact, more so. Uh, and not that we're impervious to facts, many are not, they are responsive, but some uh, would be. So I uh, was considering for a long time if I could uh, write something, because I failed in my environmental campaigns, including standing as a candidate for the Australian Cyclist Party. And I, it was really failure in my case leading to fiction. And I thought if I only could use fiction to present facts, but uh, mixed with emotion, uh, romance, travel diary, uh, then I might be able to carry those who uh, will read the book with me in the arc of the hero and sensitize them to the issues of science. Uh, and I was thinking about this for a decade. I just couldn't come up with any... Uh, anything, but then uh, one uh, uh, evening at one of the multiple pre-Christmas parties, Australia has because a Christmas coincides with summer, uh, and uh, uh, a friend said to me, "Oh, you're going to Spain. You should go and see San Juan de Compostela, uh, where the bones of Saint James, Saint James, are buried." And I thought, "I'll get some DNA and look and see what the guy looks like." Uh, and then I thought, why not someone far greater? And uh, the, uh, the plot came to mind at that point, that it would be more identical twins born out of the DNA of what um, a geneticist, uh, 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 amateur archaeologist thought were the remains of Christ, this Christ that she found. Uh, and uh, my friends told me that that was a good plot. And um, I started... Uh, writing it, uh, uh, thinking that that would take me half a year. Well, uh, as I was sitting before submitting uh, the work for publication at the cafe that where I was normally writing, a friend stopped by and said, how is the book going, the novel going as normally, right? The normal question. I said, 21 years and I'm still not finished. Uh, she said, my cousin's novel was published posthumously. I said, you are giving me hope. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the way my uh, transition to something, metamorphosis to something else, uh, was uh, from this uh, failure and this desire to do something to make available uh, in, in, a, in a comprehensible way to the average person what uh, neuroscience and environmental science says about the human, who are we? Uh, and um, also about uh, the science of uh, climate change, um, species extinction, that are so obvious to 
anyone. I mean, the, the issue now is not that um, scientists are doubting climate change. Uh, that is solved. That is, nobody is submitting. I heard the uh, editor of uh, uh, the magazine Nature who said, it's not that uh, we are rejecting papers that are doubting climate change. There aren't any submitted. That there, there, there's no uh, issue there, but that's not understood. And of course, this misinformation that happens is uh, uh, um, in, impeding this passage of knowledge from science. It is the same scientists that, or the same science that produces airplanes that you trust to travel from uh, US to Europe. Uh, it's the same science that finds the climate science that uh, if you go like this, you're going to end up uh, three degrees by the end of the century, even more. And uh, that the corals uh, in the Great Barrier Reef of Australia and elsewhere are two degrees uh, virtually non-survive. And then you're talking about the simplification of life in the oceans, because one third of life in the oceans has something to do with corals. So if you destroy them, then you simplify life. And this is what I have imparted into this book, in, of course, in a way that has emotion, suspense, as you need to do, and that's why it took me so long. It's interesting. A few things, George, came up for me. One was something I, I often say is that um, art is never finished. It's just abandoned at some point, you know, whether it's music, a book, a, a fiction, yes. a sculpture. And unlike academic work where you can come, here's my hypothesis, here's the work I've done, here's the conclusion, done. I might then set a new hypothesis, new piece. Whereas with a novel and creative works, they can extend beyond a lifetime so that was one one thought i had the other one i need to connect you to the people at x prize because they have a current prize around um the coral reefs about coral regeneration and this challenge where we have these very wicked complex challenges and problems that are so hard to get our heads around the environment and climate being one of them and then you put into the mix of that these human beings that you've spent a career mapping out these parts of the brain. But then we still have these incredible challenges where we can for decades say, here's the science of why smoking will kill you. We put it on packets and yet people still smoke. And so the facts or the emotions and we can see ah. Oh, a loved one, somebody we love has died because of that, but yet I can't help myself in a bad habit, insert the bad habit, whatever that might be, because it's maybe who I am, maybe how the chemicals react, maybe it's because my father or my parents have hunted, so I hunt, or whatever it is that culturally has given us something that is acceptable in the past. But the transition when we have new knowledge, when we have new science that says smoking kills or doing this equals lack of biodiversity, lack of biodiversity might mean no life on planet. How does that affect me when I go to the supermarket and I buy my chicken for, you know, a couple of pounds that's been mass produced? Now, you know, all of these challenges from lying on the, you know, deck naked uh, to how do I consume? How can I be additive to the environment? How can I be additive to humanity in terms of my contributions and some of that, like you've said, is through works that are maybe different, maybe through fictional works, maybe through films, maybe through stories that entice us, that uh, connect in with what will make me shift my behaviours, my thoughts, my actions. And so I'd, I'd really like to dive into that a little bit to try and bridge this neuroscience to then behavioural actions and particularly uh, around our work, how we show up in work and our work endeavors that from your expertise, from your research in the brain, what's the sort of neurological basis for what will structure a change or shift in someone's either behavior or the challenges of, of the workplace? Yeah. Uh, well, if only we had a larger um, a forebrain that is a larger frontal lobes, in fact, uh, taking the analogy if you suffer frontal lobe damage, 
you then show erosion of foresight, disinhibition, and and also a, a perseverance, a perseveration in unprofitable paths. And that's how humans look like. Uh, but of course, we cannot uh, redesign the frontal lobe. We have to understand though, who we are. My, uh, that is my, uh, uh, if you were to summarize my, uh, the why I, I wrote this novel was to see who we are and to understand that we are uh, deficient in many ways. The plan was good to get us to where we've come, but now we've altered our environment. Unless we understand, unless uh, the religions understand that they are in the way of constructing a sustainable society with uh, their doctrinaire uh, approach to reproduction, then uh, there would be little chance because whatever damage, whatever impact humans have on the environment, if there are half of us, it's half the impact. Twice as many, twice the impact. So the X prize people, uh, th that would be a fertile ground that would not produce dislocation. You are not asking people not to use their bicycles and not to use their cars. Eventually you have to in the airplanes, but at least they'll, they'll have capacity to use some electricity, not too much of it either. That is, if you are to produce a sustainable society, you have to give up a lot of things. And to understand who we are, that is, humans are, the human exceptionalism has to be put aside, uh, that we are one of the animals on the planet that manage to produce these things that are actually harmful to ourselves and to other animals. And, and uh, 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 there was a, a saying on uh, the uh, pronouns of uh, the temple of uh, Apollo in Delphi, know thyself. That's what it said, simple. Uh, uh, and uh, to understand who we are, that we're just another primate with some uh, specialization in the brain. But our brain is not, uh, uh, that different in size from uh, the chimpanzee brain as is the neck of the giraffe over our neck. But that's hubris that uh, we therefore consider ourselves uh, or, or, or as we must be uh, infallible uh, if we are to handle a technology which actually can destroy the planet. Is it possible to know thyself when you are self does it need an external body or an external factor in order to observe self to reflect it back as to who we are uh, ross i can observe you uh, <laughs> so uh, it, it, it did uh, you but know still it, from it, the perspective of self Yes, you know we, part, the yeah. difference between a chimpanzee observing another chimpanzee versus a human observing a chimpanzee, or vice versa. Do we need another species, another no, species observe us to observe us that has a cognitive ability in either parallel or another order of magnitude better? And that leads me potentially to uh, artificial intelligence, and where uh, you know we are now at the precipice of a new era of artificial intelligence, of whether they develop feelings, whether they do any of these things, whether we're using language models that just predict um, examples and words and things. We are, in essence, a prediction engine of various things that we you know, manifest prediction thought as it flows and it comes out uh, in various expressions, in speech in artistic in written word in creation of materials and different technologies that you've mentioned so do you see a future where some of the things we create can help us understand ourselves better well certainly driving at night i would rather trust uh because at the age i am uh, vision is not as good uh, uh, uh the the uh, uh, once automatic, uh, uh, the, the, the pilotless ones, uh, but perhaps you, you raise a very important issue that is, uh, will there be someone who will make better decisions than us? Well, initially we'll have to impart in that uh, machine uh, the, uh, 
the reasons, the motivation, if you like, to the extent that you know the the reasons for um, for uh, uh, and philosophers will have to help us with that. But yes, I, I would think that a machine making decisions on advice on uh, population growth would come on the side of if you want to preserve more and more of nature rather than destroy more and more of it, then you better look after uh, your population and see that uh, you reduce reproduction to sustainable levels through assisting those who don't want to have more children not to have them. So, yeah, that, that is a good uh, point though, that uh, maybe we can at least consult, if not uh, totally enslave ourselves to this intelligence that uh, is being created uh, making decisions uh, uh, outside uh, uh, the emotion of oh no i want to have more uh, of this religion so that there are more of us supporting uh, uh, the work of the true god and not the false god over there and i guess it's part of humanity's endeavor is that the next generation is better at decision making than we were so we learn some things and we want our children to understand what we've learned and go and explore and find new things and better things better ways to behave in a sustainable manner yet the human endeavor is growth and so how can we have that paradox of sustainability and growth and I think that is one of the human fundamental conditions of to love, to be loved, to grow, to grow ourselves, to grow our kin, to grow our societies, but in a sustainable manner that is not uh, destructive to other, to think in scarcity, but to think in abundance, to think that there isn't a correlation between population and destruction. And how might, if we have a greater population, can we have an even greater sustainability rather than a negative impact? And that requires a fundamental shift of behavior and thought that you're talking about of this reset uh, for us. Um, I'm interested to, to shift a little bit in terms of diving in a bit more into AI, automation, technology, in relation to not only how we understand the brain, so our understanding of the brain and how it functions, what the parts are, and, uh, you know, give us an idea from your view, how much do we currently understand? How much do we need to further understand that might give us hope in the future that we can create a, a humanity and society that is sustainable without destruction. Yeah, uh, the hope I'm not sure we will get out of the existing brain, uh, but uh, there's nothing more important than trying to get that hope. Uh, that is, I have lost, I lost hope in the 1970s, uh, but at the same time, uh, I thought that there's nothing uh, uh, that is more significant than constructing so whatever other cause you might uh, have uh, to want to promote is predicated on a sustainable planet. Uh, and now as it concerns the brain, I can pass this on this information about the brain that is an, a way of looking at it. <clears throat> We find ourselves often in a dilemma, deciding on this or that. And that actually often gives us the feeling of free will that I, I am deciding. If you ask out there, as I did, a lady sat across from me at the coffee shop and I said, can I ask you, do you have free will? And uh, uh, she said, I do, but I don't think many out there have free will. The paradox that everybody thinks they have free will, but the others, they are not certain or, well, neuroscientists have uh, actually news. Uh, most of them think that there's none, there's no free will. Uh, there's an illusion of free will because there are areas of the brain that try to pull you this way or that way. The brain is uh, like the British parliament or the Greek parliament or, or, or worse. Uh, that there are deputies that are fighting for this, the hypothalamus, who is um, saying, a uh, beautiful uh, girl is uh, in front of me, that I want to mate, to procreate. And there's the cortex that said, no, uh, let's, you can't do that. That, uh, that puts the brakes. Uh, so you have, uh, uh, the brain has multiple uh, 
uh, areas, multiple foci, and they're engaged at the end. Of course, there's a unitary behavior, unless you are paralyzed because of this some uh, dilemma. Uh, and uh, to understand that the brain uh, is limited, uh, is constructed uh, on a plan that helped uh, us to survive, to get all the bananas out of that tree that we found so rarely we come across and feed to our kids, forget about anybody else, those who were the descendants of those guys. So there's avarice, of course there's altruism because in altruism also you find that the group uh, survives, but then you have the problem of the group adherence of uh, uh, the loyalty to tribe, uh, which is one case that you mentioned earlier, the religious groups, that they get, of course, the companionship of having friendship uh, around the religion, but uh, they can find other ways, of course. They don't have to uh, go tribal, as we seem to be going more. At, there's this phase now with uh, religion being a force of evil that's more... more uh, evil is done in the name of religion uh, than in the name of the devil. Uh, and to to consider that these propensities of humanity, which were fine and got us to where we are, they are not profitable now. Uh, and you know, again, to look at who we are uh, and uh, take a stock that there can't be warring uh, nations uh, when each one soon will have the capacity of eliminating life on Earth. We certainly are facing an awful lot more polarization and the perhaps brain's evolution to look for differences and to look for things that stand out has in effect bitten us in the bum that what if we looked for similarities? What if we looked for similarities of our fellow selves rather than entering a room and say they don't look like me, they don't sound like me, they don't believe what I believe, or they want something I have and they're prepared to do something that might damage something I love. How might we shift to one of looking at where are the similarities? Where's the you know collective love, the collective endeavor for connection, for contribution uh, in a world that is more and more polarizing? And I think I, I want to ask a, a very personal question around the brain from your perspective and some of your work, because I'm I'm fascinated by the connection between all of our systems. So whether it's our microbiome of our gut and how that sends different messages and different things to the brain that then uh, will make me do destructive behaviors or constructive behaviors, right? I'm a hundred percent committed to the habits I have. They might just be bad habits or good habits that my future self will say, thank you, or I'm disappointed in you. <laughs> So I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the triggers of that. Is it the absence of something, i.e. when there's certain damage to certain parts of the brain, we see incredible capabilities in niche areas? And so we might see incredible mathematics, incredible mu musicality or various things when there is certain damage to other areas. Is it through identifying areas that have previously um, held us captive of our capability rather than a, oh, we need to learn more things. Do we, is there an area where we could just turn off a couple of those inhibitors that could mm. realize a, mm. an ability to connect, yeah. an ability to yeah. love, yeah. an ability yeah, yeah. to do something greater than we currently can? Yeah, that that's a, a fundamental issue uh, of uh, if something is inhibiting, certainly uh, some. Uh, brain surgeons do exactly that to uh, re to uh, remove or alleviate uh, symptoms in some diseases like in parkinson's disease uh, they insert uh, an electrode in uh, an area where which is responsible for the tremor that uh, they show and uh, they are successful so that's why they do it uh, incidentally um, some of them use our maps so i feel sometimes it's useful that uh, it might actually help the maps of the human brain to localize uh, uh, with precision uh, the structures of the brain. So, but by and large, I wouldn't give up 
any part of the healthy brain in the hope that uh, there might be some uh, benefit. Uh, when they, they they tried in obsessive, uh, obsessive compulsive disorders, they've tried it, but even that now they try reversible ways of stimulating, which in effect also produces temporary uh, lesion, temporary yep. uh, deadening. A suspension of, the, yeah. of a facility and yep. an action. What if it wasn't um, no going back, i.e. a surgeon versus other methodologies so we use different methodologies uh cognitive behavioral therapy we use tapping we use yes. maybe plant medicines uh different things to be able to deal with uh post-traumatic stress injury not disorder or various different ways in which we can uh try and evolve the way in which the stories coming back to uh, a novel versus an academic paper coming yeah. back to these yeah. stories we tell ourselves around that's right you know, what is tomorrow? How do I need to behave? What could I do effectively today to set me up for success tomorrow? If my work is evolving, if my company's shifting, you know, from a neuroscience basis, what are those sort of principles that we can do to foster that more adaptable behavior, a more open behavior, or an ability to allow new when we've been so ingrained with just, you know, learn this, fire quickly the same thing, protect that knowledge and repeat and repeat and repeat to break that cycle. What's what's the secret or the area to be able to break cycles that are no longer working? Yeah, well, that's fundamental. As to, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, of uh, looking at a larger unit. And I was thinking that if we could only say, let us look at the humanity, which you also said, look at that we're all human rather than looking at the differences. And I thought Europeans did this at least briefly with the establishment of the European Union. Unfortunately, uh, the UK absconded, uh, left. And uh, uh, this is sad. I was hoping that uh, in that experiment, you could have uh, more nations accrued to it. And then uh, then you wouldn't have uh, likely of a war between uh, France and Germany or between the States and the U.S. Now that's a larger unit. Uh, California never invaded Nevada. Uh, so if you have a larger unit, you find uh, the common good is larger, it's greater. The countries around the Mediterranean could look after it. So, yes, but now what in the brain can make you... Uh, uh, more uh, uh, involved with the, or uh, exhibit more such behavior uh, than uh, the alternative of uh, being um, a tribalist uh, in and within the tribe, uh, uh, you know, really a, a local, uh, you, you are simply parochial looking just around you or uh, uh, identifying only with your larger religious unit and not beyond that at uh, humanity i think education will is the only thing really the the, the cortex is capable of stopping you from uh, uh, committing murder you don't need to uh, uh, to re-engineer the brain but again through education that's why i wrote the novel uh, the it, it's not that and uh, I, I understand what Parts of the brain I would rather have expanded, but I can't do that now. You're not going to breed people on the basis of their frontal lobe getting becoming larger, which you can do, by the way. You only have to select people with um, such uh, uh, capacities. Uh, you can uh, breed a generation, next generation, that is, is more sensitive to one thing or another. If you uh, selectively breed those who have the feature you want, I did. Uh, I worked with rats in that domain when I was at the University of California. Uh, in that case, it was intelligence in rats. Yeah, and I think we have a a very interesting few decades ahead where gene therapies, gene editing, CRISPR, of designing different humans for different endeavors, uh, whether that's physicality, whether it's cognitive abilities, and we we're entering this realm of where you mentioned around fact versus fiction 
is that this fiction is becoming a possible, but we ne we lack the ability to ethically understand whether we should. And where previously it would have been in the hands of maybe a select governments or few, now biohacking, the ability to change and shift who humans are. I know that uh, Elon will be announcing very soon something around Neuralink as a breakthrough of the uh, brain chips and the interface of what that unlocks. And I think we're at a very pivotal moment in humanity's history of this transition and, and shift as we uh, expand. And I loved your thought from self, from parochial, through to then multi-species and maybe planet viewing the whole planet to then viewing galaxy and beyond of what is our place coming back to know thyself? Who am I? Why are we here? And I, that's part of the poetic dance of humanity, isn't it? To continually philosophize, to um, use science to try and help us to create a version of ourselves that we would be proud, proud to leave behind and proud uh, that is there. As we come close to the time, George, I wanted to ask you a question that's linked to curiosity and linked to doing things for the first time. And as children, we're doing things for the first time in this nature versus nurture. You know, you've talked a lot about nurture in terms of education, our environment, things that happen in the way in which we respond to them. When was the last time, George, you did something for the first time and what was it? I sang not long ago. <laughs> uh, that was the first time. Uh, and uh, But it was with uh, a, a local encouragement and, and demand. I don't know why. I had written the lyrics of uh, the poem. Uh, the, and, uh, the music was set by a friend. So perhaps uh, they thought that I should be given the honor of seeing it. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I I did that. Oh, and yeah. tell me about that experience. So you wrote some lyrics, friend put some music, and you sang it. Then that was a first experience. What did what was that like? What did it feel like? And what do you observe when you reflect back on that experience, George? Uh, well, uh, I was actually well received. So all these years, I never sang because I thought the, my voice was terrible, uh, and. Uh, so I'm encouraged. Uh, I'm going to sing again, I think. <laughs> At least I, that song. <laughs> I love it. So this uh, undiscovered talent that George has <laughs> in a long list of talents and uh, legacy that he's, uh, you've already gifted humanity. As we come to the final close, there's two final bits I want to uh, offer. If people want to get in touch with you or maybe they're interested to, to read your book, how do they get in touch and where can they access uh, the book would be fantastic. And then the uh, last piece, if you could implore some form of wisdom for our listeners of how they might think differently or behave differently to create the kind of, of version that you envisage we should be looking at, where do they start? So how do they get in touch with you? And what is an action or something we could do right now that will help us move towards this uh, more abundant, more sustainable life? Right. As to getting in contact with me, uh, they will easily find my email um, at Neuroscience Research Australia. But uh, if they put my name and if you find somebody holding a rat, looking at a rat, looking at a brain, uh, that would be me. Uh, so that would be easy. Uh, the book itself is called A River Divided. And uh, if they want the audio version of the book, I'll be happy to send it to them free of charge. Uh, wow, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, yeah. yep. We'll get some links uh, in on the sh show links as well for that as well. Yeah, uh, and you're welcome to also put my email uh, there. Uh, it's amazing how pleasant it is if somebody writes to you uh, and, and in science, you don't get often um, a letter that say thank you for doing this. Uh, once I got one, and I got my co-author and said, come, let's read this because we're not going to get another one. 
<laughs> but it, uh, literature, you get a few more, but again, not many. And if you get one for somebody who saw something in uh, the mega themes you try to um, cover, uh, then um, and you connect it in some way, um, then uh, it, it is very pleasant. So it will be a, a pleasure to receive as to what one does. Uh, I think if we think of the following, that this generation, that is what is injustice in the world and what is intergenerational injustice, uh, this generation is setting the conditions for the extinction of its own progeny in uh, a terrestrial inferno, not in simply dying because in in philosophy uh, they consider um, if you kill something didn't feel pain well uh, nobody knows uh, there are no friends there to lament to make in other words feeling pain uh, feeling discomfort that is really what's unethical well it's not going to be dying in their sleep but it will be likely in conditions much like now in failed states where people don't have um, medical care education uh, and and uh, they can they can feed the, their families so if you consider that uh, that issue uh, uh, which is really uh, one of the heroes mentions this about intergenerational injustice in the book. Uh, then, uh, then if you don't act on that, realizing that we now are doing this, then there's nothing else you can um, tell someone uh, to motivate them to just really look what we are doing. It doesn't have to be your children, other people's children, even animals. That is that. Uh, 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 even they too will feel the pain. And for what gain? Human happiness has not increased in the last 50 years that have been measuring happiness. And now we are destroying the planet far faster than back then. Uh, like multiples of times, each one of us the impact on the planet. So to uh, consider uh, which really uh, something that Christ said too, uh, uh, and other philosophers, that uh, uh, to uh, consider your neighbor, not to do to them what uh, uh, you wouldn't like them to do to you, uh, and to love uh, uh, their neighbor. And that's why I picked Christ to be the person uh, to be to ask the question, would Christ today, with somebody with the genetic endowment of Christ, join Wall Street or street protests uh, uh, and uh, uh, to reflect on us uh, and uh, on the humanity at large, which you mentioned earlier, what are the myths we're saying, that we're humans and we're part of a big beast which is called living creatures uh, and to, to consider ourselves in that larger unit than tribalist, uh, in a tribalist way. I love it, George, this thought of loving when it's hard, when it's difficult, when it's not the norm. To love somebody who is in your family versus love somebody who is in an opposing uh, view or thought, be that religious, be that territory, be that species. To love when it's hard unconditionally, to come back to the fundamentals of to treat thy neighbours as we want to be treated ourselves and neighbours is all. Uh, exactly. I love that. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show, George. Uh, it's been a fascinating story and your work, I am uh, in no doubt, has created a flow of activities and ripple that will be beyond both of our imaginations of what you have uh, given the gift of thought, of endeavour, of research and I can't wait to dive into your novel. I'll tap you up for the audio version on that, George. And thank you. Again. Pleasure. Thank you. And may I wish to uh, all your listeners uh, that their brain shrinks less than expected for their age. <laughs> thank you. Do you have the level of adaptability to survive and thrive the rapid changes ahead? Has your resilience got more comeback than a yo-yo? Do you have the ability to unlearn in order to reskill, upskill and break through? 
Find out today and uncover your adaptability profile and score, your AQ. Visit aqai.io to gain your personalised report across 15 scientifically validated dimensions of adaptability. For a limited time, enter code PODCAST65 for a complimentary AQME assessment. AQAI, transforming the way people, teams and organisations navigate change. Thank you for listening to this episode of Decoding AQ. Please make sure you subscribe on your favourite podcast directory and we'd love to hear your feedback. Please do leave a review and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.